Go get it. Cheers. Thank you, Rob. It's, it's been a packed morning of product announcements and demos. Um, Liam, have you ever seen a demo as calm as that when the internet goes down? <laughs> that was quite impressive. Jason, it is fantastic to have a lightweight monitoring only version of controller at last. I'm I was really excited to see the demo, really excited on what that means for people who are running Nginx in production. The product team's put a lot of work into this morning, as I'm sure you can see, but we're only the face of what goes on behind the scenes. And in F5, we're the front end of a large engineering team, the core Nginx team who came in through the acquisition, but as Francois mentioned, many more engineers have been added to the team. So a lot of you, you're listening on the live streams at the moment. Um, I just want to give a shout out and thanks for the hard work that the engineers have been doing in the last few months to help build the products and the demos that we've been showing this morning. So thank you, guys. As I said, this is our last session, and we're going to talk about microservices. We'll talk about Service Mesh. We announced our Service Mesh project last year at Conf. And some of you will have seen a demo of the developer build that we showed in the breakout session yesterday. But as Rob described, there's a lot of, I wouldn't say confusion, but misunderstandings or questions around what a service mesh is and when is it needed and what does it do and do I need one? So let's take a step back and review what is the story behind service mesh. For the last couple of years, the industry as a whole, ourselves included, have been evangelizing the benefits of building distributed, cloud-native, microservice, microservices-architected applications. They promise to give you more agility. You can develop components in parallel. They're not tightly bound. You can get code into production faster. You don't need to do a big bang release. You can push out the bits as they change. You can potentially resolve problems faster. At least when you find an issue, you can patch the running application much more quickly. And it talks about, we talk about the benefits of developer productivity. Now your developers can use the language and the stack of their choice for the individual components they're building. A front end might be built in Ruby. A transaction processing engine might be built on Node. They can pick the language that they prefer or the language that's best suited for their particular service task at hand. And with this, we've seen a large adoption of microservices as an approach for building applications. In our user survey, one of our questions is, who is using microservices in production? 42% of respondents this year are actively using microservices in production, up 13% from 29% last year. A further 37% of users are either using them in pre-production or they're actively investigating this as an approach. And of the organizations that are running in production, we find that about 60% of those organizations are still running, well, of those the applications they're running, about 60% of them are still monolithic, 20% of them are pure microservices, 20% are hybrid, the, the strangler pattern that we talked to in one of the breakouts yesterday, where people are extending existing monolithic applications with microservice add-ons. So it's a complicated space. It's more complicated because there were a few things that maybe weren't given enough thought or enough concern whenever we talked about this approach from a monolith to a microservice. There are significant challenges with managing a microservice application. If you go through this, transa this transition, you'll find you've created a multi-headed, multi-limbed monster that is near impossible to tame. Gus's analogy yesterday of an application as a living organism, a microservice application with lots of components, there are tentacles everywhere. You have hundreds of components tangled together, knotted together, interconnecting, all looking identical, all looking like containers that are, very, that are much harder to introspect. What have we done when we've moved from a monolith to a microservice? We've replaced a stable, predictable monolith with a distributed networked application. With little regard for the consequences that by changing a function call that makes a direct call to another library in the application, we change that to a function call that makes a networked call to a component running somewhere else in the data center, possibly even somewhere else in the world. 
and it can go wrong in so many ways. Joel Spolsky, when I was an engineer years ago, I read a lot of Joel Spolsky's blogs, and he coined the law of leaky abstractions. All non-trivial abstractions, to some degree, are leaky. Abstractions fail. Whenever you try and abstract a function call with a network call, it leaks. The things that can go wrong with a network call come through into the function call. Now your function call doesn't always return, or it can time out, or it can return an error you aren't expecting. You can be trying to talk to a server that isn't even there. I like looking back at how our industry began. And at my university, um, there was an, a professor um, who was part of the early implementations of early computers. A lot of you may know of, you know of ENIAC as being, it's known as being the world's first programmable computer. It was a, a US initiative. Um, they did, you know, of, of course, designed for military purposes. It was used for plotting ballistic trajectories. It wasn't quite the world's first. There was one in the UK called Colossus that span out of the Enigma breaking project at Bletchley Park. But in the UK, there was a counterpart to ENIAC called EDSAC. And David Wheeler was one of the senior engineers on EDSAC. It wasn't used for calculating ballistics. The first program they ran on it calculated tables of square numbers and prime numbers. And it's, it discovered one of the world's biggest prime numbers at the time, a 79-digit prime number. And this gentleman set the foundations for a lot of computer science. And he coined an aphorism that is often used. All problems in computer science can be solved by another layer of indirection. I don't know who's, who's heard of this. As, well, yeah, a few of you have heard of this. It's a fantastic aphorism because you can reuse it in so many ways. And in the microservices space, it's been reused to say that all problems in distributed microservices can be solved with another level of proxies. So this takes us to how do we solve some of these problems of managing distributed applications using technology, like Nginx. This takes us on a journey that starts with EDSAC and David Wheeler in 1949, and brings us now towards Service Mesh in 2019. We had an intriguing situation, intriguing results that again came out of our user survey. We asked people, how do you use Nginx? And one of the options we put in, just to see what would happen, was as a Service Mesh, knowing we didn't have a Service Mesh product. But it was curious to know how people responded. And we find amongst our broad community, three, now 6% of our users identify as service mesh users with Nginx. And if we look at Nginx Plus, cut that cohort, it's even greater. A seventh of our Nginx Plus users use Nginx as a service mesh. How does this compute? We're not shipping a service mesh product. But our users are ingenious. And the leadership that we've taken within microservices is paving some of the ways that service mesh technology has developed. You'll have heard of many of the production patterns for microservices that we have shared with our users. The ingress controller, of course. We talked about that earlier on. The router mesh. And some very microservices-like or service mesh-like approaches that take you along the journey. If you're trying to solve the problem, of routing traffic within a distributed microservice application, the first step that takes you on the journey towards a service mesh is a very, very straightforward one. Take a cluster of services, cluster of pods acting as a service, and put a load balancer in front. It's very, very easy to deploy. It's simply a matter of deploying another service consisting of Nginx load balancers and swapping a couple of names around so that your web service service the application servers becomes web service internal, and you call the load balancers web service, and they load balance to web service internal. And having done those name switches, anyone who tries to access that service hits the layer of proxies first. And that lets you implement access control. It lets you implement smart load balancing. You can do canary tests and A-B tests. It lets you implement metrics and tracing, web application firewalls should you need it. Very low resource, relatively simple to deploy, can be developed by the application team or by your DevOps team, taking the, the load balancing configuration specific to that service and deploying a load balancer specifically for that service. Stage one towards service mesh. And then we can get a little bit more granular. Instead of having a separate load balancer, we can make it even more lightweight 
by embedding Nginx within each individual pod as a per pod proxy. Nginx is tiny. Liam has a wonderful demo where he runs Nginx off a floppy disk. Talk about old technology. It's about it's the same size as the Bash shell. And you wouldn't worry about spinning one of, the, one of those up inside of your container. So you get closer to the app. This is not a novel approach. Any time anyone runs an application that doesn't do HTTP well, they'll put Nginx in front. If you're running PHP on top of PHP FPM, you've got to put Nginx in front because it doesn't even, even have an HTTP interface. You run something like, I don't know, Oracle WebLogic, another Java stack, um, a Node or a Ruby application where you're just not happy with the way that it handles HTTP, it is very, very common to put Nginx in front just to massage and correct and modify the way that HTTP is handled. Typically, this sort of solution is built by the app team, and it's invisible to operations. It's just another container within the pod running a simple ingress proxy. This falls short for one reason. And the reason that these two solutions don't quite meet the promise of what a service mesh is trying to handle is that they only deal with ingress traffic coming into a pod. They don't deal with egress traffic coming out of the pod. And there are some use cases where you want to be able to control both ends of the connection. When an application in a, po in a pod generates a connection, you want to capture it at that point and control it before you send it to the, uh, to the other pod where it's picked up by the proxy in that pod and terminated and passed to the application. And the two most common use cases you may want to do that are if you're wanting to implement end-to-end -end encryption. And it's just too difficult or not possible to operate SSL encryption on the client side on the originating application. You want to put a proxy in place to do that. So that's one case. Another case might be that if you're tracing or monitoring your traffic, if you monitor it at the server end, so on the right-hand side of this slide, then your monitors are one-sided. They, the, they don't cover the impact of the network and the latency. The traces are one-sided. So you may prefer to take monitors and traces from the left-hand side of this diagram. So there are cases where people want to be able to use a proxy to control both ends of the network traffic. There are ways to do this now with Nginx. We have an, an architecture which we call the simple mesh. We industrialize this as our Nginx fabric model part of our microservices reference architecture. This is where the technical implementation begins to creak. It begins to become difficult. You can embed Nginx inside a pod and handle ingress traffic, just as we described before, and handle egress traffic with a little bit of DNS or a little bit of IP tables to route outgoing traffic to Nginx. And then the burden is on you to understand what services could this application potentially be accessing and build a virtual server configuration for each so that you can capture and interrogate and handle each of those services correctly. Tooling to deploy this is complicated. Our fabric model helps. And it requires that you have prior understanding of the topology of the application. It's very difficult to change this on the fly if the topology changes. It's very difficult to update credentials or policies or routing. Usability is a challenge. So this takes us to the end of what we can achieve with Nginx on its own managing the configuration. We can build a service mesh-like solution. I call it a simple mesh solution to differentiate. But it has its limitations. And this was why the approach of a service mesh emerged. A service mesh is a generic solution, similar to the simple mesh, but it's designed for general purpose applications where you don't know the topology of the application in advance. It absolutely needs a control plane, and this is where the complexity begins to come, because the control plane needs to learn the topology of the application and to push the individual routing rules out to every single sidecar proxy running within your application. Every single pod is a sidecar proxy. Every sidecar proxy needs to be configured dynamically by the control plane. Any single change in the topology or the policies of the application need to be pushed out to every single instance of the running application. Some implementations have an SDN-like approach where they call back whenever they see something they don't recognize, which then adds latency. 
It's general purpose, so it overcomes a lot of the usability challenges of the earlier approaches I described, but it's a lot more complicated and a lot more dynamic. And as those of you in operations or SRE know, even if a complex system can be made to run reliably in dev and in test, when you put it into production, when your army has to face a real enemy, then all the rules are off. All the testing goes to the side. You don't know what is going to happen. And these systems can be very, very difficult to debug, to operate, to program, to control. That said, Nginx is in the process of building a service mesh solution. Why is a service mesh solution appropriate within the Nginx architecture? The attributes of modern applications, they are hybrid. They use web and API, multiple stacks, and they need multiple technologies or facilities or capabilities to deliver them. We saw the capabilities of the Nginx as a load balancer. We talked about the data plane earlier and when Jason touched on it in part of his controller demo. We saw how Nginx can be used as an API delivery capability. And an internal service mesh is also an important capability to support a modern distributed hybrid application. The recent acquisition from F5 has made an enormous difference in our service mesh development. Um, Francois alluded earlier on to 120 plus engineers coming from F5 working on Nginx projects. Some of those engineers are now working on our service mesh. So we're seeing a very impressive velocity in service mesh development. Our architecture, again, we went through this in more detail in the breakout. So I won't labor the technical details of the different components in the architecture. But I will touch on controller because a service mesh should be self-organizing, a little bit like Gus's living, organ living organism. It should sort itself out. It should generate its own configuration. But it doesn't naturally get it right. And we will be integrating service mesh into controller in order to help you refine and control the configuration of your application. What I'm showing you now are just they're, they're concept diagrams of what controller could look like when we get through to the engineering work to allow controller to, in this case, adopt a service mesh. Give it their credentials, point it at your service mesh API, and controller can import the running service mesh configuration, automatically generated when your applications were deployed onto service mesh. The first task you have is making sense of what is running. And when you first deploy your application in a service mesh, there is no knowledge of what the topology of the application is really like. We have eight services. They could all potentially talk to each other. So you end up with an 8 by 7 over 2 graph of connections between all those services. Controller will be charged with understanding what is happening within your application. By pulling live metrics out of the application as traffic goes through, it will be able to assist you in a guided configuration of to help you establish the topology of your distributed application, going from the previous mess to something a lot more structured like this. As it observes traffic, controller will be able to give you hints on what flows are real and what flows can be removed. And then it can build the topology. Once that's established, then managing, debugging, applying policies to individual flows within your microservice app become much, much easier. And controller will work with the operational processes that you need to support a microservices application as well. A process such as a blue-green or a canary test is something that controller would be in an ideal position to help guide you through. You present the new version of your service. Controller can orchestrate the task of moving traffic from old to new, monitoring the KPIs that matter to you, error rates, response times, and the like, and then going performing either a gradual, successful deployment or winding back if those KPIs were to fail. This gives you a preview of what we're building for the first generation of our future service mesh solution. Supported by F5 and Nginx, integrated with controller, leveraging proven technology 
So where possible, leaning on existing technology that you will already have in your data center. Things like Grafana, and open tracing servers, and Spire, but loosely coupled. No hard dependency between the data plane and the service mesh control plane. And additionally, no hard dependency from the control plane to the management plane. But this is just a step on our journey. There are limitations of sidecar mesh architectures, sidecar service mesh architectures. Some real challenges. The architectures that are being brought to bear by early movers in this space, Istio, Linkerd, um, HashiCorp, and ourselves, give you sidecar proxies everywhere. IP tables all the way down. Kubernetes is a tower of IP tables, and service mesh implementations just put more on top of that tower. Running in production, as we mentioned, very different to running in test and development. Operational for complexity, fragility, near impossibility to, be to debug. I talked about David Wheeler and his pioneering work on EDSAC, one of the early computers in 1949. And it brought to mind another early computer, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. Who's heard of MONIAC? Monetary National Income Analog Compute? Some, someone has. Good. Again, built in 1949. This was when we were still trying to figure out how computers would work. And the aim of MONIAC was to build a computer to monitor, to monitor and model the income and the economy within a country. Um, the UK used one. Some were sold to Guatemala. They went to various schools. The Harvard Business School built one. 14 were shipped, um, developed by an engineer called John Phillips, known as the Phillips Hydraulic Computer. This was not a water-powered computer. It was a water computer. He took inspiration from the fact that money is often like water. It just slips through your fingertips. This computer was water. It used bright pink dyed water to run through a series of tanks, tanks to represent the disposable income, diverters to take off tax, um, money to going into consumption and to end user spending, um, the patent diagram on the left. This was a successful computer. It was able to, to model the UK economy to an accuracy of 2%, or an error rate of 2%. I like to think that you could even do things like quantitative easing, add more money into the system by topping up the water. You could probably model inflation with evaporation. Some of the water will disappear from these tanks. Um, reprogramming it would be quite a challenge. That would be a major exercise in plumbing. And I hate to think what would happen if you ever got a core dump. That would be seriously messy. <laughs> this thing had promise, but it's now a museum piece. Some of the ways that we try and solve problems work for a while, but don't always take us to the end. This didn't work. David Wheeler's quote did work. His approach, building a programmable computer, set the foundation for how we build computers now. I was a little bit misleading, because I didn't tell you the entire of the quote. This is just the first half of the quote. All problems in computer science can be solved by another layer of indirection, except for the problem of too many layers of indirection. And I worry that there's a dangerous amount of indirection happening with service mesh architectures. Your distributed application does not need a sidecar proxy. It does not need IP tables. It does not need a complicated control plane. It doesn't even need Kubernetes. It can run many other ways. What, it, what you need is a secure, reliable, instrumented, easy to control, easy to manage data plane so that you can see and control how these distributed components talk together. So as we close, I want to leave you with two thoughts. The first thought, keep it simple. Understand the problem at hand and use the minimum technology necessary to solve that problem. If you make early bets on where technology is going to go in the future, in the microservices or the service mesh space, things are changing so quickly. There's no guarantee your bet will be right. So use the minimum technology at hand necessary to solve the problem at hand. And the second thing, the last thing I want to leave you with is that there may well be life beyond sidecars. Igor talked about building a proxy module 
into unit to handle egress as well as ingress traffic. I will leave that thought hanging there, but I do ask that you come back this time next year in 2020 to our next conf, and I look forward to seeing you there and telling you about some of the things that have happened in Service Mesh in the year to come. So thank you for your time. It's been great chatting with you. I've enjoyed sharing our roadmap, sharing some of our vision. So thank you again.